We saw spires and towers, and a dreamlike castle through rolling hills, twisting rivers and dense forests. We approached, but were pushed back by strong winds, forced to land in shallow water along the shore. From the sky, we saw an island only a few thousand feet across, but from the ground, there is an entire world inside. The Scottish island of Pabe has long been of interest to the Authority. AEDF satellites have registered strange energy readings there, signifying a level of weakened reality. The island is home only to fantasy author Randolph Gowering, who is composing the final work in his beloved Care Ashland series a monumental fantasy novel and its greatest to date. After leaving the island to meet with its publisher, Gowering suffers a fatal stroke. In an instant, Pabe is transformed into a place straight out of Care Ashland. Technology has no place on the island, only the magic items and fantastical gadgets carried by its many inhabitants. The magical beings who inhabit the island cannot leave, but their supernatural treasures are ripe for the taking. With tactical gear and high-tech support rendered useless, Authority security is forced to adapt. The twisting castle of dreams looms in the distance. Wizards, witches, elves and alike populate the lands. As the island creates the missing conclusion to the Kerr Ashland series, the Authority hurries to investigate and take what it can before the last page is written and the book is closed at the end of the decade. The Current State of Care Ashland OAS Fantasy Literature Working Group For General Issue Note, Physical copies of this document hand-inscribed on vellum or papyrus are available for personnel who are required to operate within the bounds of the Care Ashland Anomaly. If you're cleared for this document, it means you're somehow involved in the utter chaos surrounding the Pabe Island incident and the subsequent formation of a semi-extra-dimensional fantasy kingdom in its place. Given the apparently literary origins of the Pocket Dimension, the OAS has made a detailed survey of Gowring's previous works in the Care Ashland series, in the hopes of providing some general context for what, exactly, Care Ashland represents as a geographical area. More detailed plot analysis of the series is widely publicly accessible. We are including book cover glosses and previews from the released and promised volumes of the series to provide a general analysis of the scope of the plot. The Novels Randolph Gowring has produced 36 novels since the release of its first, Spelltaker, in 1978. While different series he has produced, notably its popular Sands of Glass, Voice of Iron books, which have received several film adaptations, do not share a common storyline or canon. They maintain an internally consistent magical system, and are implied to exist on different continents in the same world. The Care Ashland series, his latest, was intended to cover six books. The first five have been released publicly worldwide, to substantial critical and fan acclaim in the English-speaking world, and at the time of writing, a television adaptation of the first volume is in production. Volume 1 Triumph of the Empirical The Empirical clans of humanity have long served the ancient and decadent Spire Elves, whose reign over the land of Kara Ashland from their capital and the Castle of Dreams has grown corrupt and cruel. In a Spire Elf university, overworked mage professor Jeddah Malaka stumbles across the discovery that will revolutionize magic on the island unaware that he is about to set in motion events that will destroy civilization as he knows it. Volume 2 The Source of Magic Jeddah Malaka's brilliant but naive attempt to control the source of magic has failed, and a foul corruption spreads across Kerr Ashland. As the Spire Elves turn against their former human allies, Malaka works desperately to undo what he has created. In the distant Ashwoods, however, those Spire Earths worst afflicted by his experiment are plotting a new order, one that will end the Spire Elves for good. Volume 3 Sword of Prophecy Kerr Ashland is at war. The Ashen Folk advanced against the ruins of the Spire Elf Empire, while the Orcish Dominarchy and the Underguild of the Dwarves make their own place for control of the increasingly corrupt Castle of Dreams. And far off into the hinterlands, 
unassuming fisherman's apprentice Hassan Maza makes a discovery that might just end the war. Volume 4 The Underguild Rebellion Hassan Maza and his band of unlikely heroes have done the impossible, brokered an uneasy peace between the Rampage and Dominarchy and the remains of the Spire Elves. As he sets his eye on the Castle of Dreams, however, dark tidings arrive from Underheim. The trade families of the Underguild are in open civil war. Volume 5 The Caves of Crystal Hassan Maza and his new bride Kalith of Mistwood find themselves on an unlikely honeymoon. The Ashen Folk seek peace, as the corruption twists their underground kingdom to the breaking point. In the crystal caves of the Deep Refuge, Kalith navigates the nightmare that is Ashen Folk politics, while Hassan makes a discovery about his hated enemies that will shake his beliefs to the core. Volume 6 Castle of Dreams Randolph Gowring has as of yet refused to divulge major plot points for the long-awaited final volume in the series, save that it will involve Hassan and Kayla's perilous journey to the Castle of Dreams to heal the source of magic, and that it will conclusively resolve plot threads related to the characters of Gareth Heliodor, Solkoth of Bitterfield, and Meg Heck Bloodrisen, introduced in previous volumes. The Island Assuming that the current geopolitical state of the island is roughly approximate to the books, the OASFLWG assumes the following. Due to the experimentation of a human society called the Empirical Clans, the source of magic, which regulates reality and care Ashland, have been irrevocably damaged. The Empire of the Spire Elves, who previously controlled the source, responded to this catastrophic event by splintering into two warring factions. The Ashen Folk, an immigrant population of the Northern Spire or Territories, have declared independence, and have been fighting a bitter war of rebellion against the Empire ever since. It is believed that the damage to the Source has caused permanent and irrevocable biological and psychological changes to them. The Empire has wasted its energies fighting the Ashen Folk, and conducting brutal ethnic cleansing against the Empiricals resulting in the extinction of the majority of the human population on the island. Simultaneously, the Empire has been confronted by the breakaway of the independent Duchy of the Mistwood, an organized slave rebellion among the orc species calling itself the Dominarchy, and increasing tension with the oligarchy under guild trader states. If the literary plot of the Kerr Ashland series is being followed, somewhere on the island, an archetypal hero wielding an artifact plot device called the Sword of Prophecy is currently in the middle stages of a quest to bring peace to the land and restore the source. The FLWG would like to clarify, however, that there is increasing evidence that the situation on the island is no longer properly following the plot of the original novels, and that conditions on the ground may not match the above. Notably, reports are spreading that the hero Hassan Maza may have suffered a fatal injury during a critical plot point of Volume 6, Castle of Dreams. The hero lunges, the Sword of Prophecy in his hand, alive with runic fire. His opponent assumes an ancient elven dueling stance, features twisted into a mask of fear and hatred. In the brief moment before their blades touch, there is a ripping, as of torn threads and pages. Hassan, no! So dies the hero. Known Locations Note that the following list is very much incomplete, and even cursory reconnaissance of the Kerr Ashland anomaly has revealed substantial differences between information derived from the books and officially published maps. Locations Discovered Occupied by Authority Forces The following locations have been charted by Authority Exploratory Personnel and do not match with pre-established locations from the literary canon. OL Site CA Camp Cranach The current Authority base of operations near the Beach of Beginnings, built entirely from local materials. Palisades and earthworks provide some protection from roving magical beasts. Pages End Unstable areas of literary reality, characterized by marked inconsistencies with book locations, spatial distortions, inexplicable writing, and strong smells of ink and paper.
Incoherent spaces. Areas of incoherence and inconsistent reality. Objects, landmarks, and creatures from across Gowring's novels appear at random, typically never seen again. Lingering in these spaces is extremely unsafe. The Corrupted Lands Former capital province of the Empire of the Spire Elves, now twisted and damaged by the corruption. A dangerous battlefield full of swamp and thick forest, populated by monsters, magical anomalies, and roving ashen folk and spire war parties. The Castle of Dreams The former capital of the Spire Elves, now a ruined and twisted monstrosity that may or may not be a single intelligent entity, contains the source of magic. The Nightmare Road The remains of the only intact Spire Elf road through the corrupted lands, fought over constantly by the Elves and Ashen Folk. Watchers Rest A half-destroyed spire occupied by Spire Elf forces, the main staging area for Elven expeditions into the corrupted lands. The Ashwood The volcanic jungle inhabited by the Ashen Folk, formerly part of the Spire Empire dominated by huge caves and cooled magma chambers. The Deep Refuge The deepest portion of the cage beneath the Ashwood, the main seat of Ashen Folk civilization, though it is rumored that ancient things live in their depths. The Lord of Ash A semi-active volcano, which gives the Ashwood its name, and its constant coating of volcanic soot. The Old Observatory an ancient spire observatory built to monitor the Lord of Ash and warn of upcoming eruptions, now occupied by the Ashen Folk. The Night Glow A chain of volcanic mountains along the northern border of the Corrupted Lands, so named for its near-continuous lava flows and lakes of boiling sulfur. Worm Spear A broken spire once carved in the shape of a dragon, now in use by the Ashen Folk as a naval base. Under High Mountains, a more geologically stable mountain range that extends to the east of the Nightglow, known for its incredible mineral wealth, inhabited by the Dwarven Underguilds. The Great Marshes, a sprawling wetland on the eastern border of the Corrupted Lands, inhabited mainly by bands of empirical clan refugees and the occasional Underguild trader. The Moldering Spire, a collapsed spire on the edges of the Great Marshes rumored to be inhabited by evil spirits. The Eye of God A peculiar eye-shaped crater on the edge of the Great Marshes, believed by locals to possess magical properties. The Beach of Beginnings A mundane beach inhabited by small human villages, notable as the location of an ancient and half-forgotten prophecy. All authority attempts to land elsewhere on the island have instead been redirected to this area by unknown means. Wethir, a vast steppe plain, once the breadbasket of the Spire Elf Empire, but now controlled by the roving nomads of the Orc Dominarchy. To its east lies the Bay of Wethir, once the seat of human power. The Siren Coves, rocky reef-covered shorelines covered in caves which are inhabited by predatory sirens. The presence of hundreds of ancient shipwrecks makes this coast an inviting if dangerous target for treasure hunters. The Thrall Spike An abandoned spire, captured by the orcs during the Corrupting Wars, now the de facto capital of the Dominarchy. Barharo, Ellenhall, Briss Former empirical cities, destroyed by the orcs and the Spire Elves during the early days of the Corrupting Wars. The Spirelands The ancient and glorious empire of the Spire Elves now fallen into decay, dominated by ruined spires, massive magical towers that once contained whole cities. Mistwood, a temperate rainforest and semi-independent duchy of the Spire Elves. Thievesport, the wealthiest city-state within the Mistwood and seat of the Duke of the Mists, known for its large human ghettos. The Desert, a great expanse of seemingly endless sand rumored to contain ancient and powerful magical cities which are forever hidden by sandstorms and mirages. The Dragon's Graveyard, one of few navigable points within the desert, an ancient mountain of fossilized dragon skeletons protected by mystical forces. 
Extracts from Anomaly and Counterbriefing The following is a selection from an initial OAS analysis briefing on the nature of the Kerr Ashland Anomaly and its effects on further research and exploration. Alright, the pamphlets you received in the briefing package yesterday explain all this in more detail, but we'll go over it again. The projected energy field surrounding the island forces away certain artificial materials, regardless of scale and exact composition. By certain artificial materials, we mean almost all petroleum derivatives, plastics and everything but natural rubber are right out, plus certain ceramic materials, carbon fiber composites, and some more exotic metal alloys. You could be wearing polyester undies under a cotton uniform and the field would blast them off along with your pants. Unfortunately, the same applies to contact lenses, certain kinds of tooth filling, and pacemakers. If you've got medical implants of any kind, you're not visiting the island. The same energy field also has a disruptive effect on a large swath of the electromagnetic spectrum. You can bring handcrafted radios in, but they'll have an effective range of a few meters. The guys at ProLab put in a lot of work forging these items with only basic metals. None of them worked. Those maniacs managed to create muskets, gunpowder, and a combustion engine that could be brought past the field, but none of it was worth a damn once we brought it on the island. Most chemical explosives simply won't light. Most guns fail to pass through the field, but ammo doesn't work anyway. You want to shoot something? I hope you're good with a crossbow or a sling. The island is only a couple of kilometers across in the real world, but once you're on it, it's about 200 times that size. Don't enter unless you're equipped for a long walk. There's also a massive desert somewhere, but we're really not sure where. It's either on the east or west. You'll only ever stumble across it. The official map of Kerr Ashland, drawn by Randolph Gowering printed in the softcover edition of Volumes 1-3. The new map of Kerr Ashland, released in the hardcover editions of Volume 3 and all subsequent printings of earlier volumes. The unattributed new map, released with Volume 3, remains divisive among fans. While many hold that it is a superior piece of fictional cartography to the black and white map included in the original softcover printings, Others hold that the alterations it made to Kerr Ashland's geography are non-canonical. While alive, Gowring refused to confirm which map is correct, furthering endless fan debate and argument. Note that neither map entirely matches conditions observed on the ground in the Kerr Ashland anomaly. ASF swapped their guns in Kevlar for plate and rough spun cloth sourced from a dozen legacy Octorita suppliers. Camp Cronach resembles a renaissance fair at times, albeit one with deadly serious intent. The trails to certain landmarks are coherent, but still unsafe. A waykeeper hoists his light. A caravan marches through a fictional forest. An ASF sergeant was trapped in the corrupted forest for some time with one of the proud recalcitrant spire elves. Their mutual survival provided an opening for authority diplomacy in the spirelands to obtain powerful artifacts. The sergeant expressed his doubts over the humanity, the realness, of these literary creatures of Kerr Ashland. She seemed real. Following their traipse through the corrupted forest, diplomatic channels were opened between the Authority and the Spire from which the elf hailed. Here a well-coiffed diplomat negotiates for artifacts. The escorts, in the finest tradition of bored grunts, talk and banter around the perimeter. Our organization was founded by magicians and alchemists, mystics and zealots. We feel, not without justification, that we have moved beyond them, transcended their limits, and yet here we are, digging deep into our doctrines for the fantastical things we once sought to root out. This page attempts to document all information regarding Kerr Ashland that should pose useful to have on hand within the island. To that end, this document may be transcribed onto vellum or papyrus for use within the island. 
Editor's Note Normally, we would wait a bit longer before releasing one of these, but expeditions are happening right now, and you need the info. Excuse our notes and the incomplete sections. This page will be updated as we gather more information about the anomaly. We're working on this as fast as we can. Magic Artifacts Catalog This section documents miscellaneous magical artifacts recovered from or discovered within the Kerr Ashland Anomaly. Artifacts and information not useful to operations within Kerr Ashland should be limited or excluded. As noteworthy artifacts are recovered from Kerr Ashland, this list should be extended accordingly. Designation MA001 Rune of Agility Description A purple crystal like rune stone. An X like symbol is inscribed onto its front base. Current Location OL Site CA Found Locations MA001 instances are generally in the possession of Tinkerer Dwarves and must be bartered for. Properties Improves its holder's senses of direction and agility. Maintains its effects when carried within a satchel or backpack. MA-001's properties diminish significantly if removed from Kerr Ashland. Designation MA-002 Raging Blade Description A two-handed sword decorated with depictions of various scenes from the Kerr Ashland's human religion, branded in gold. The sword is constantly engulfed in flames, and launches streaks of fire when lunged. Current Location OL Site CA Found Locations MA-002 was gifted to ASF personnel by a nomad human tribe as gratitude for defending them against an aggressive pack of Spire Elves. The humans disappeared into the forest before proper interview could take place. More MA-002 instances may exist within the possession of other human tribes. Properties MA-002's anomalous effects manifest when the wielder encounters non-human entities. The subject will lose control over their body and start aggressively arguing with its now defined adversary over the validity of their religions, often including a flurry of insults and slurs. The subject will be unable to cease and the debate will only conclude once the other entity exits the location. Incident MA-002-1 While Captain Hammerton was testing the combat capabilities of MA-002 outside of camp, a group of merchant dwarfs approached the camp to offer various goods in exchange for gold. Upon spotting the merchants, Hammerton began shouting, belittling their false god of dirt and mud and insulting the dwarves with slurs such as coalskins, greedy moles, earthworms, and little feet. The dwarves became enraged and attacked Captain Hammerton, fracturing his jaw and both of his ankles. Hammerton was forced to take a medical leave from the island for two weeks. Designation MA-003 Asterisk Pendant Description A ceremonial pendant made of gold painted with a representation of the Saint of Life, Astray, in white robes and with a similar pendant in her hands. The pendant relates to the cult of Saint's religious belief. Current Location OL Site CA Found Location Temple of Astray, Frost Breath Mountains Properties Wearing, holding, or carrying the pendant will grant the subject Astray's blessing which will instantly cure the subject of all illnesses and provide immunity to disease until the pendant is removed. The blessing must be activated by praying at the temple's altar. The monks of the temple describe the blessing as, quote, a reward for those brave enough to travel to the temple and pray to the purest of saints, unquote. All monks have been observed wearing MA-003 pendants and alleged to know how to create more but they refuse to share the creation process. Designation MA-004 Deathly Obelisk Description: An 8-meter tall obsidian obelisk in the shape of a rectangular prism. MA-004 has a torch mounted 2 meters above the ground on each of its sides. Text is inscribed across the obelisk's entire surface, documenting an ancient civilization of four-armed humanoid beings 
who worship the god of death. This god is depicted as sparing its worshippers, effectively granting immortality, but at a great unspoken cost. Current Location 8 km north of OL Site CA Sightings of similar objects have been reported at various places within the desert. Properties Magical items and effects within 100 meters of MA-004 are nullified, with the strange exception of enchanted metal objects, as well as any magic relating to death, including necromancy. Designation MA-005 Phantasmal Shell Description: A curved iron plate extending 5 meters out of the ground. Parts of the plate have rib-like skeletal segments, visibly fused with the iron. A blue glowing substance covers large areas of these skeletal segments. Current Location Northeast of RPC-448 Exact location is variable. Properties Within 500 meters of MA-005, a number of white, incorporeal, slender entities appear at random intervals. These entities are silent, and appear most vividly when immediately beside MA-005. A particular entity, which bears its iron crown, appears for longer durations and remains still, intensely watching individuals within the perimeter. The crown hovers above the entity's head, and four sets of wings are sprouted from its back. Designation. MA-006 Floating Bucket Description: A tin bucket perpetually suspended 6 meters off of the ground. Current Location Displayed at Grugga's Weird Thing Circus, within a glass tank. Currently owned by a swine man named Grugga Bogo, living in Eldestwald. Properties The bucket isn't affected by gravity, according to Grugga. He allowed an authority agent to move the object around with a stick to demonstrate. MA-006 hovers, as if it were suspended in a vacuum, completely absent of gravity. What else am I supposed to write here? Locke. Remember to write about the dwarf that knows Argentina exists. Doug. Regions. Here information about areas that have been discovered during the authority's stay in Kerr Ashland will be documented. Put regional map here when completed. Night Glow watched them. Position Across the Night Glow volcano chain, bordering the corrupted lands to the north, some outposts stretch to near Wormspear and Nightmare Road. Population Ashen Folk Elves Political Organization Feudal Military Society The Night Glow watched them. Is considered to be the backbone of the Ashen Folk military due to its elevation above the Ashwood jungle. Beginning as just a few small observation towers, the Watchdom grew to be a militaristic province with a district and independent social order. The area's culture is built around vigilance, discipline, and obedience, considered to be core virtues. Watchdom inhabitants rarely converse with other races. Flows of lava and sulfuric water make extended stay in the open dangerous, limiting the frequency of any movement between watchposts and strongholds, and requiring major preparation for any substantial journeys. Magic barriers are generated around surface fortresses, as well as underground villages, as protection against natural danger. Paranoia is common across all social ranks. Commanders are quick to send messengers to other Ashen Folk outposts to alert them of observed suspicious movements. Children, mothers, and elders remain in underground cities, while younger men are sent to man the surface fortresses. The villages inhabited by Watchdom civilians are often older than the Ashen Folk themselves. The builders of these small cities are unknown, and their story remains unacknowledged by the Ashen Folk, perhaps due to a lack of interest. Allies, other Ashen Folk. Current state, standing. Settlements, the Cinder Beacon, large fortress. Underside, large city. Gorlond, Black Lake. Minor settlements, Old Observatory, Port Aldhiri, near Wormspear. Ash Watch, Lord of Ash Volcano. Multiple beacons, watch posts. Iridan, 
Smith, remind me to get that map drawn with someone who can actually draw as available. I don't care what Locke says, I am NOT using that piece of crap map Mark drew. It had poor craftsmanship and was wildly inaccurate. Doug. Position: Northeast of Under High Mountains, surrounding the Iridan River. Population: Humans. Political organization: Feudal. Society: Prior to the Corruption War, Iridan was a place of controversy. The only human civilization free from elf abuse. Iridan was a small, lively kingdom where knighthood and wizardry were in high regard, and trading, particularly with dwarves, was vital to obtain necessary resources. Within official Kerr Ashlyn canon, Gowering gives very little information regarding the formation of Iridan. Four months prior to his death, he stated on a local podcast, I'll write about the birth of Iridan when I'm done with the sixth book. I know my readers want it, and it will come. Just be patient. The Corruption War left Iridan devastated, with the majority of the region's survivors and refugees fleeing to Phyton. These survivors consist predominantly of knights and allegedly the Prince. Allies Dwarves of Underheim Current State Fallen Settlements Phyton The Kingdom Capital Information regarding Phyton prior to the war is scarce. The city was mostly abandoned at the start of the Elf invasion, with the exception of the King and his immediate subordinates, who perished in the conflict. The city architecture appears to have Gothic influences, with great spires and a number of palaces and cathedrals. The city is described in the books as a haven for humans who have survived the Elf genocide, suggesting it is slowly being repopulated. Eketo the second most populous city of Iridan, and a primary trading point with the Dwarves of Underheim. Eketo was destroyed during the war. Minor Settlements Illidems Atruber Abrissen Regions to write up next. Corrupted Lands Marshes and Weather We're still waiting on intel about the others. Doug Creatures and Races Spire Elves Fill this out later. Doug. Dwarves. Capital. Silverbound. Under High Mountains. Political organization. Oligarchy of trade families. Deeply intertwined with a caste system of craft unions. Tiered beneath the priesthood. Religion. The Sons of the Mountain. This religion is centered around the deity of Father Mountain that, according to myths, created the first dwarf. Hammer Lig Goldheart, from mud, stone, and a golden coin. Dwarves see things such as mining and forging as religious acts, being that they follow the steps of Father Mountain. The priesthood of the dwarven world are the ones in charge of managing the internal mining operations of the society, and birth alongside other religious acts. Biology Dwarven biology is mostly inorganic, with composition of stone gold, and other diverse materials. The exact ratio is believed to be 50% stone, 20% gold, 10% biological material from both parents blood, and 20% other materials of choice. Dwarven skin color and texture is determined by the materials the dwarf is constructed with. Skin is typically coarse, unless the dwarf is created with a large quantity of smooth stone. Dwarf hair begins as dark brown or light yellow, but slowly becomes orange over time, believed to be caused by oxidation. Dwarven diet consists of minerals and rocks. Meat, ale, and other foods are often consumed for enjoyment, rather than for any nutritional value. Due to their biology and reproduction methods, dwarves lack sexual organs. As of writing, we don't have witness evidence of this. A majority of dwarves take on a social role equivalent to that of males in human culture. However, there are dwarves which could be classified as women. Dwarves reproduce by methods of alchemy and religious rites, performed by the priesthood. These rituals are mostly kept secret from non-dwarves, but the process is often described as akin to forging. 
The average dwarven lifespan is approximately 210 years. Over time, dwarves oxidize, which will eventually cause substantial erosion. At the point of death, dwarves return to the materials they were forged with. Society Dwarven society is ranked according to the material a dwarf was forged with, rich families using precious metals and gems, while the lower class use materials such as coal and bronze. Connection with Magic Due to their unconventional biology and creation, dwarves do not possess a natural connection with magic, but can manipulate it with the use of machinery and runes. Allies Significant trading partner of most nations and city-states by necessity. Current state Tenuous peace between the trade families. Small but thriving society. Testimonials Dwarves are small but hit harder than you think. I like them. And if you've got gold or ale to grease them up with, they'll like you too. Fierce little buggers, but always willing to sell you the armor off their back if you offer them enough. And just as likely to scrap a new one together from whatever's on hand to replace it. Grunk. Orcish Border Guard. Humans. Capital. None. Political organization. Former independent monarchy. Now small villages and puppet states of the Spire Elves with the exception of Iridan. Religion Cult of Saints A variety of miscellaneous superstitions, somewhat similar to Abrahamic religions. Society Secluded to small villages, in the swamps of Wethir, the Frostbreath Mountains, and Phyton. Disorganized and rural. Biology Identical to standard human biology. Allies None. Current state Near extinct. Testimonial Boring, plain, and remarkably dull. Fascinating that such a creature could exist. Something so close to an elf, yet with all the best qualities removed. Perhaps if they lived longer than mayflies, they would have learnt enough common sense to have avoided their fate. Yet, alas. The backstabbing little beans caused the corruption, and thus all the mess because of it. And for what? An alliance with that worthless wretch of an elf? Maoka, and its vile experiments? I can only say I have one regret regarding the humans, that we did not manage to get rid of all of them. Alice Swiftwing, Spire Elf High Mage Orcs, Capital, the Thrall Spike, maybe? Political Organization, Dominarchy An in-fiction term, or a system of governance in which otherwise unaffiliated tribal groups hold collective respect towards a central figure, capable of rallying them as a unified force when deemed necessary. Religion To be determined Biology I'm not qualified to write this section. Doug Society To be determined Connection with magic Orcs face significant difficulties in becoming mages, compared to other races, but hold an innate connection to magic. Each orc possesses the intuitive sense of ambient and concentrated magic. Allies None Current State A loosely affiliated collection of tribal groups spread across most of Kaer Ashlan, centralized within the Wether Plains. Testimonial The whole lot are savages, plain and simple. Literally so. The Spire Earths did all this, really. Their fault as always. I suppose it's always their way. Ask an elf for a poem, and they'll come back with a sonnet. Ask him for a slave, and they'll come back with a grudge-bearing gladiator. They shattered them, reforged them into ultimate slaves, then gave them the perfect tools, skills, and reasons for rebellion. What were they before the elves got a hold of them? Bah! Don't bother asking. They already tried. Dingo Dritz, Human Anthropologist Swine Men Capital The Village of the Filth Eldestwald Political Organization Communal Hamlet Ad Hoc Rulers Religion All Covering Flesh The Swine Men believe the world and sky are protected by an infinite mantle of flesh, created by their ancestors. According to Pig Scripture, once a Swine Man dies, they will join the Wall of Flesh to protect it from the horrors beyond.
translating wall paintings from the swine men's homes suggests that families perform cannibalistic rituals in order to absorb quote, the essence and memories unquote, of the deceased. This has not presently been verified. Biology The swine men are, essentially, standing pigs with moderately enlarged brains. They demonstrate the ability to use language, problem solve, and otherwise display a level of basic sapience. The pigs reproduce quickly, and have a diet consisting of the magical crops they farm. These crops are extremely dense in nutrients. Society Oddly, the swine men seem to regard their female population as a completely separate race, known as swine women. This makes absolutely no sense by definition. They are the same race, and should be treated as such in practice. Just don't imply to one of the swine men that they are of the same race as their women, or some tables might get flipped. Connection with magic unknown. Allies unknown. It seems that other races tend to cook and eat the pigs a lot, which is unsurprising. Maybe they get along with the elves? Current state Small but stable population Testimonial Tasty fuckers Dwarf merchant Nokrom Goldfinger Archdragons I'm hoping Locke will write this one, given his direct experience. Doug why the hell did you write the entry for pig people before anything about the elves? Seriously, Doug. Priorities. Smith. Registered Phenomena Code 448 Object Class Alpha White Hazard Types See Below Containment Protocols The object in question is still under study by a Care Ashland Expeditionary Force Detachment, and as such, proper containment protocols and hazard types are not present. Furthermore, the following file is currently being revised for relocation and rewriting as the validity of the object in question status as an anomaly is considered uncertain. We apologize for any inconveniences. Description: RPC-448 is a building complex comprising a large, elaborate rock tower, as well as its underground segment, spanning several hundred meters in total. RPC-448 is located inside the Pabe Anomaly, and as such, its exact location cannot be ascertained both due to the technological difficulties presented by the anomalous energy field surrounding the anomaly, as well as its widespread geological inconsistencies, commonly referred to as Kerr Ashland. However, it is always approximately in between the Deep Refuge and the Guardian Spire. Main Point of Habitation for Ashen Folk Elves Large Spire Elf Fortress, located at the borders of the Ashwood Jungle. RPC-448's current height is average when compared to other elven spires. However, the upper section has been destroyed or collapsed, potentially having its original height. Notably, RPC-448 consists of a single tower, instead of the usual twin spires inhabited by spire elves. While RPC-448 itself does not constitute an evident anomaly, it remains the single major location in Kerr Ashland that is not mentioned in any of Randolph Gowering's work, including unrelated drafts and other work outside of Kerr Ashland series. RPC-448 is also exempt from any geographical or topological anomalies common to Kerr Ashland. The tower and its immediate surroundings are as self-consistent as baseline locations. RPC-448's existence is, however, acknowledged by most entities inhabiting Kerr Ashland. Commonly referred to as Worm Spear or Worm Spire by locals, information about its history or purpose is scarce and unclear. Most known races in the island actively evade passage near RPC-448 for unknown reasons, refusing to elaborate further. Currently believed to be due to the presence of corruption 
as well as nearby Ashen Folk military strongholds. RPC-448 surroundings are employed as a naval base by Ashen Folk Elves, providing access to Kara Ashland's main river network through the Cinderflow River, which crosses most of the Ashenwood jungle. Ashen Folk Homeland and Main Military Stronghold However, RPC-448 is never interacted with by the Ashen Folk, citing a lack of a necessity to do so. No explorations or surveillances of RPC-448 have ever been conducted by groups native to Kerr Ashlyn, and no scriptures regarding it have been found, with all acquired information proceeding from rumors and folk tales. The results of RPC-448-related questionings on locals have been buried. While orcs seem to largely ignore its existence, dwarven travelers commonly know of it, and many have visited it with the purpose of sightseeing. Of note, all questioned Spire Elves refused to speak about RPC-448, only alluding to the fact that it was never meant to be inhabited. Ashen Folk have been the most vocal regarding RPC-448. Below. A report written by the Office of Analysis and Science is attached. Despite many, many attempts at questioning even the friendliest of folks of many races, I'm afraid to say we know little to nothing about the Wormspire. The story we know begins somewhere around the start of the Corrupting Wars, when it was destroyed. That's a red flag. We know it existed before then, but we know absolutely nothing else. And nobody seems to either, save for the Spirers. Their reticency to talk doesn't seem to be founded on pragmatism or dread, rather on taboo. Its destruction occurred sometime after the Ashen Folk breakthrough north of the Nightmare Road. The oldest inhabitants of the nearby naval base claim that their initial takeover of the road allowed them to beeline to the fortress spire now named Watcher's Rest at the border of the corrupted forest and besiege it, at which point some sort of rumble, or perhaps roaring, was heard coming from the southeast. Once their siege was finally repelled after several weeks, they were forced to retreat back into the Nightmare Road and set up a camp near the Wormspire. By the time they came, there were large amounts of debris nearby, all of which seem to have disappeared since. Ashen Folk warriors have both claimed that they did not know of the Wormspire until then, and that it was deliberately avoided during the first expedition through the Nightmare Road. A common story regarding the Wormspire is about its inhabitant, a large, powerful flying creature known as the Eidolon Worm. The Eidolon Worm is said to have lived in the Wormspire before its destruction. While it is known to have been carved in the shape of a dragon, descriptions of the titular worm are entirely different. Narrations indulge in describing its long, luminous, and blue-armored body, black, muscular skin covered with invulnerable metal plates. We believe it had some mechanical components, as descriptions of toothed metal wheels sound awfully similar to the gears or cogs that we know. The term Eidolon itself is rather strange, and coincides with the Wormspire's primary anomaly. It does not appear elsewhere in Gowering's work. While mentions of ghosts or apparitions are common in fantasy, the word Eidolon is nearly never mentioned and seems to carry a certain malice to it in Kerr Ashland's folk stories, as the destructive power of the worm is said to be both typical for Eidolon and extraordinary in of itself. While we commonly believe that the Eidolon worm was responsible for the worm spire's destruction, we simply have no evidence to confirm so. We haven't been there to see its destruction, but the way the Ashen folk described the debris they found seems to suggest an inward collapse rather than outward explosion. So, perhaps the structure was particularly weakened, or old? No way to know with what we have now, and there are no outward signs of deterioration on RPC-448. So far, no inner explorations could be carried out, only external surveillance. Between July 14 and 16, 2020, the main bulk of the ASF CAEF North reached the outer border of the Corrupted Lands catching up with the 15-man scout division that performed the initial reconnaissance of the Nightmare Road and encountered RPC-448. After the end of a short skirmish between Spire Elves and Ashen Folk were the main entry point to the Nightmare Road, resulting in mutual retreat, 
Expeditionary forces proceeded inside and searched for RPC-448, found two weeks later in the expected location. While Camp Ithel was being built near RPC-448 as a stronghold within the Ashwood, an exploration was performed. RPC-448 was found to be hollow on the inside, with a spiral stairway climbing upward. A 25-meter wide hole, filled with water and extending for an unknown depth, is located in its center. RPC-448's inside was found to have numerous separate low reliefs, apparently depicting unrelated events of usually violent nature, featuring several Kerr Ashland races. However, these reliefs are largely incoherent, with figures having an unnatural number of extremities, abnormal extremity length, and unusual weaponry, among others. Apparent sides and races in conflict are randomly scattered and often seen engaging in combat with themselves as well as each other, with no evident coherency or purpose. As the height of reliefs increases, so do violence and incoherency in them. Along the end of the intact section of the stairway, the lower portion of a large, unidentified shape can be seen, presumably continuing into RPC-448's destroyed segments. Between these regular carvings, other, less polished reliefs are often present. These consist of simpler shapes and written words, sometimes more akin to pencil drawings and stone carvings. As their height rises, the strokes that compose these figures grow more erratic and less streamlined. A few sample descriptions of these reliefs have been attached below, numbered by their proximity to ground level. Relief number 7 Description Outline and face of a hooded figure. Its face from the nose above is covered, but the mouth displays a neutral expression. Its clothing is noticeably ragged. Below it is a 20 cm line, identified by an ASF scout as a short segment of River Clyde near the Clyde Arc Bridge. Accompanying writing What are these homeless people from my dear city? They stick with me, even if I dislike them. I don't like these weird people showing up near me. They are like sex, but they disappear and show up different next year. They're uncomfortable to be around, but no one does anything about these hooded ones specifically. I need to stop thinking about it. Just walk home. Just walk home. I don't like sex. What is an empty sun? They keep talking about it. This is worrying me. Would they have jumped me if we weren't in public? What will happen when I'm alone? Who are these people even? Do I know them? I have to lose them. How? How do I lose them? I don't have friends nearby. Stop following me. Stop following me, please. Relief number 17. Description. Two circles, one considerably larger than the other. The smaller circle is full, while the larger one is empty. Accompanying writing. Empty sun. Empty sun. Those words quite stuck with me. Where did I hear them first? It's a weird sum of words, right? It rings familiar, since beliefs of a hollow earth were commonplace back in the day. But it is also so… so unbearably alien. How can a sun be hollow? It's like asking how an earth can be flat, or perhaps it is empty as an unfeeling, or cold? Relatively cold stars do exist, yes? Or maybe the word empty is used as a discriminator between a regular sun and a, well, empty one? Yes, this makes sense. Perhaps an empty sun would be colder, or smaller than ours, and would feel like a shade or a mirage against the real thing. No, that's too depressing. But it sounds so wonderful to write about. Wait, I said real. Is an empty sun fake? Like a shell imitating a real sun? No, it is larger. Much larger. Could an empty sun be a shell for our sun to grow in, and then break out of? Like a shed skin? That's interesting. A fascinating train of thought. Hollow. No. Empty. Empty sun. Empty sun. How inspiring. Yes, they taste the same as the inspiring whispers of my midnight muse. Not mine, but mine to use. I have to write something with it. Now that the brain ink is fresh, and finally put my dreams to words, yes. There is some delicious imagery to carve out of them. Ha, empty sun. 
is a wonderful motif to write to, and so are the hooded men I dream of. Relief number 35 Description A set of eight separate avian wings, arranged in two sets of four. Accompanying writing Wings, wings, what could they mean? I should make these mean something if I'm so insistent in shoehorning them in. What are wings for? To fly out of an abyss, perhaps? Abyss. That's a good word. Abyss. Spire. Yes, abyss spire. Rising out of the abyss is a good motive. But do I really have a place for it? My story rather seems to follow the opposite direction. But since when? This is too dark for me. I don't like it anymore. But I could still change direction, right? This could be a good step to do it. Yes, I have to do that. Why am I so intent on including these nightmare motifs anyway? They're not even familiar to me. This is my story, not my nightmares. They do not mandate what I write in my books. I have to remember that. I have to find somewhere else to unload all this toxic runoff. Maybe a short story. Something Lovecraft-esque? It's got to be something real foul to push away all this fear and finally get something joyful out. Relief number 147 Description: A crown, with nine outward spikes pointing up. It is cracked in half by the middle. Accompanying writing This is my story, not yours. This is my story, not yours. Keep focused. I have to keep my eyes on the ball. Don't get distracted. I am not a child to be afraid of sleeping in a dark room. This is my story, not anyone else's. Come on, focus. Just for a while more. Let's put out at least a paragraph tonight. Keep focused. Come on. This is my story. It's not yours. It's mine to write. Keep away from it. Go away. Go away. You don't rule my story. God fucking damn it. Leave me alone. Just leave me alone. What is an Eidolon Worm? Initially, exploration of RPC-448's lower flooded section was considered impossible, as viable diving equipment cannot be properly crafted with known materials that are able to pass through the Kerr Ashland Anomalous Barrier. However, three months after CAEF's Norse arrival to RPC-448, commerce with Dwarven Travelers allowed purchase of a set of seven custom protection rune complexes which would prevent the passage of water in a one-meter sphere around the user, allowing both for protection and oxygen supply underwater. Four of these complexes were transported by foot to Camp Ithil and received around November 10, later put to use on continued exploration on RPC-448. RPC-448's lower segment was found to be largely empty and scarcely illuminated by floating, immobile white crystalline solids. These crystals are tangible but do not respond to external force. Their composition is currently unknown, and does not appear to correspond with any known crystal formations. A number of entities, similar in appearance to baseline animals found in abyssal pelagic zones of the ocean, are often seen appearing from inside RPC-448. Also known as abyssal zones, and lower than 4,000 meters in depth, meaning that these entities are anomalous in nature. Animals in these zones have adapted to lower temperatures, high water pressure, and absence of light, largely feeding off animal matter dropping from osher oceanic layers, as well as hydrothermal vents. Abyssal grenadiers, pelican eels, and several types of sea spiders, corphonades armatus, urifarnix pelicanoids, and pantapoda respectively are common inhabitants of this zone. In rare occasions, Specimens of Mesonicatuthis hamiltoni can also be seen. Also known as Colossal Squid, mainly inhabiting mesopelagic and bathypelagic zones, 200 to 4,000 meters in depth, but previously believed to also reside in the abyssal pelagic layer. At around 1,200 meters depth, a number of interlocked steel beams prevent further descent. These are considerably bulged upwards, as if struck from the opposite side with great force. Moving these beams has so far been proven impossible. Observation of the opposite side is noticeably more difficult, as the illuminating crystals present elsewhere through RPC-448's lower segment are completely absent.
Use of lighting spells have proven ineffective, as either quickly and unexplainably nullified. In the brief moments where observation was possible, explorers reported seeing something large of unspecified shape moving. A small stone altar is laid on top of the center beam, with a sword firmly nailed on top. Removal of this sword has similarly proven impossible. RPC-448's purpose in Gowron's vision for the Care Ashland book series remains unclear. During July 7, 2021, the following handwritten draft was recovered from Ishmael Gowron's possession. Randolph Gowron's brother, inhabitant of London, United Kingdom. This is the only known work of Randolph Gowron to mention a worm spire. According to Ishmael's testimony, this particular draft is unusual in that it is somewhat stilted for its brother's usual writings, even considering preliminary drafts. Its significance is unknown. It rains. It's raining red. God has slid his neck, says a passerby. His eyes gaze absently along the street, the same absence of every six o'clock excursion to work. It's Monday, and the absent pairs of eyes abound far and wide. The man lifts his left hand holding an open umbrella, and extends his right, reaching for the rain. The red rain impacts his index, and squeezes through it and the ring finger, tinting both red. It falls to the ground, and tints the pavement red. It drags itself to the street, tinting the asphalt red, and drips inside the drainage. God has slid his neck, he says again, quieter. He scratches his neck and keeps walking. God has slid his neck, says an old lady from a balcony, twelve floors above the passerby. She extends her right, reaching for the rain. The red rain tints her too, and sticks to the balcony. Is it blood, or is it oil? The old lady stares up from the balcony, her face now wet and red. Red droplets fall over her eyes, and they too are tinted red. It's a misty Glasgow morning. The old lady keeps staring up struggling to see through the mist. A gray, twisted reflection of sunlight responds to her. She can barely see the curved form of a turbine, or a windmill, or a cannon. Over that form extends the curved tower, twisting unto itself, spiral. Things she can't see reach for the rain, from the tower, the unreal worm spire, holding the red rain, and it slips between the spirals, falling like oil over Glasgow. God has slid his neck, says the old lady, red drops falling on her throat. God has slid his neck, says a child, suddenly silent, from the window of a kindergarten over River Clyde. Something undulates and slides through the mist. Are those spider legs, or dragon scales, or an idolic shell? It's the Eidolon worm flying over the city, over the drowning chapel. God has slid his neck, shouts the teacher to her class and the child returns to his window, yawning off boredom. God has slid his neck, says another child, and the teacher responds, God has slid his neck. Is it God, or a machine? Is it God, or a red star? Is it God, or a color from space? Is it God, or soul bleeding? Is it God, or oil? Is it God, or the Eidolon worm reigning over all? Is it God, or or a phantasmal force? Is it God or an otherworldly eye? Is it God or the red rain? Is it God or are they bees? Is it God or an authority? Is it God or a whisper? Is it God or a howling tomb? Is it God or a machine? Is it God or a red wire? Is it God or a closing tomb? Is it God or an undertaker? Is it God or a buried tomb? Is it God or the departing steps of the Undertaker? Is it God or rigor mortis setting in? Is it God or a machine? God has slid his neck, says my son, looking at my eyes. God has slid his neck, I say, looking at his. God has slid his neck, says God, slitting his neck. God has slid his neck, and the sky darkers, sevenfold pattern realized. God has slid his neck, and the clouds begin to fall. God has slid his neck, and the oxide squeaks. God has slid his neck, and the stars are fading away. And the stars are fading away.
Registered Phenomena Code 360 Object Class Gamma Yellow Hazard Types Extra-Dimensional Hazard Teleportation Hazard Sentient Hazard Containment Protocols Due to the circumstantial nature of RPC-360, traditional containment methods have been deemed ineffective. Continuous expedition into the Pabe Anomaly Care Ashland, will be required in order to better understand the phenomenon surrounding RPC-360. At this time, containment efforts will instead focus on compiling relevant data discovered within the anomalous zone, including forensic evidence, which may prove beneficial in the ongoing investigation. A collaborative effort with these port authorities has been proposed to the Duke of the Mists, but official approval remains pending. Duke of the Mist is the title granted to the current official who presides over Thiedsport. Furthermore, any deceased individuals discovered within the realm of Kerr Ashlyn, who are believed to be victims of RPC-360-B, are to be transported to OL Site CA Camp Cronach, for a preliminary inspection before being extradited to Site-007 for further evaluation. The epitaph scrolls found alongside the deceased are to be digitally transcribed and uploaded into the electronic archive at Site-007. RPC-360 is a designation given to the recurrent phenomenon during which an individual, hereby designated RPC-360-A, will be spontaneously transported to the realm of Kerr Ashland, before subsequently falling victim to a specter-like assailant, hereby designated RPC-360-B. To date. Authority assets had discovered a total of six deceased instances of RPC-360-A during routine visits to Thievesport. Forensic research into the identities of the deceased has revealed that they are all individuals who were officially documented as missing shortly before being discovered within Kerr Ashland. Additional evidence suggests that an individual residing beyond the boundaries of Kerr Ashland may be inadvertently transporting instances of RPC-360-A into the spatial anomaly through the use of written fanfiction scenarios. This theory is further supported by the fact that every instance of RPC-360-A encountered thus far had a scroll comprised of Cypress papyrus forcefully inserted into their esophagus upon initial discovery. A species of aquatic flowering plant belonging to the sedge family Cyperaceae these scrolls contain personalized messages and are written in a prose that is inconsistent with the dialogue style regularly seen with Randolph Gowring's work. At this time, there appears to be no viable method to subdue RPC-360-B, and all attempts at communicating with the entity have failed to yield palpable results. Interviews with the inhabitants of Thiesport suggest that RPC-360-B is an entity commonly known as a wraith. A wraith is an undead creature whose name originated in Scottish folklore, a type of ghost or spirit. Wraiths were traditionally said to be the embodiment of souls who are either on the verge of death or who have recently passed on. According to information provided by a native blacksmith, wraiths are susceptible to weapons forged from celestial orichalcum, a type of thaumaturgic alloy that can only be obtained from meteorites that land in Kerr Ashland. Due to the scarcity of such metals, it is currently impossible to test the validity of this claim. Per eyewitness testimony, manifestations of RPC-360-B will ignore any bystanders present in favor of RPC-360-A. Should RPC-360-A attempt to escape, RPC-360-B will continue to pursue them until it has fulfilled the task of terminating RPC-360-A. Once RPC-360-A is confirmed to be deceased, RPC-360-B will then proceed to vanish. Discovery RPC-360 first came to the authorities' attention during a diplomatic visit to the city-state of Thiesport. It was during exploration of Thiesport slums that Agent discovered the disemboweled remains of a middle-aged Caucasian male in an alleyway. The corpse had been stripped of clothing and local authorities were unable to identify the remains. The presence of this cadaver did not coincide with any of the plot points previously described by Randolph Gowring's narrative, 
and the handwritten scroll found with the cadaver made references to .NET, a website dedicated to sharing and critiquing works of fanfiction. This, in turn, led to Authority Assets launching a supplementary investigation into the identity of the deceased. Forensic analysis revealed that the remains belonged to one Morgan Starlington, an English professor who had been reported as missing since September 25, 2000. Five identical incidents have been documented since RPC-360's initial discovery. Please see Addendum 360-1 for an archived log of all known RPC-360 incidents. Addendum 360-1 Victim RPC-360-A Date missing Last known location Epitaph message Morgan Starlington RPC-360-A-1 September 25, 2000 Cleveland, Ohio The marked one was dead. A vengeful specter doomed to forever wander the accursed realm of complacent gods and treacherous demons. The remnant tatters of his reputation hung over his shoulders, a ragged hood that obscured his marred visage from the scornful gaze of a world undone. The cowardly scholar could feel death's frigid breath tickle at his neck with its imminent frost. There was a moment of placid silence, as if the world itself had stopped to mourn his incoming demise and then the marked one would claim its prize, the scholar's flesh torn asunder by a phantasmal fury. Suffice to say, he died like a bitch. Bro, fuck your critique. I wrote that in honor of Randolph Gowering, gtfo.com and never come back. Miguel Demas, RPC-360-A2 October 16, 2000 Madrid, Spain of all the stains that tarnished Steedsport's reputation, he was perhaps the worst. He worked as a street sweeper, a man tasked with keeping the city-state's community pristine and presentable. Every motion of his broom was filled with purpose, meticulous in his quest to clean up filth, blind to the fact that he himself was the true rubbish. And he did it all for free. No compensation. He was overweight. He reeked of piss and shit, and he met his end in the darkest alleyway of Thiesport, another victim to the Marked One's vengeance. Fuck off, Janny. Stop deleting my post. You let Harry Potter threads stay up for days, yet you delete the one Gowering thread. What the fuck? Jessica Sapp RPC-360-A3 October 30, 2000 Queensland, Australia She walked with a sultry strut. Beggars and noblemen alike caught in the coquettish trance of her swiveling hips as she trekked through the bustling streets of Thiesport. Yet, unbeknownst to the fools who clamored for her hand in marriage, the angelic dame was a common harlot, a street walker with little regard for the justice and goodwill of her fellow man. She simply came and went as she pleased, swindling an entire community of its dignity, that is, until she encountered justice in its most tangible form. The marked one simply smiled as he tore into her flesh. Nobody cares about your crappy cosplay photos. This website is for writers, not for attention whores. Kill yourself. Robin Chu, RPC-360-A4 December 11, 2000 Los Angeles, California The marked one was cornered. He could feel the abrasive roughness of cobblestone brick brushing against its backside. There was nowhere to run, a true dead end. His foe had seemingly outsmarted him. The brave watchman brandished his rapier valiantly. Then, in the blink of an eye, it was over. The watchman was dead. A mangled puddle of bloodied pulp. The marked one wins again. You're an idiot, my guy. Just because I sent an angry DM to other users on this site doesn't mean I'm responsible for them suddenly disappearing. Maybe they just realized I was right. You mods pissed me off. Get a real job. Margot Chu, RPC-360-A5 December 24, 2000 Los Angeles, California The Watchman's widow was delirious in her quest to slay the marked one, driven by an insatiable vengeance that burned beneath her bosom like a fermenting bile. 
Her stare was cold, yet flickered with the defiant embers of fury. As the marked one stared into her eyes, he could only see a reflection of his own hateful spirit. He could not allow her to escape, not after she had threatened to return with an army. She would soon join her husband. Look, lady, I'm just a writer. I joined .NET in hopes of meeting other fans of Gowring's books. Call the cops, I don't care. I had nothing to do with your husband vanishing. But here's an idea. Let's test his theory. If you fuck off too, maybe I'll start believing. Percival Wright RPC 360A6 January 10, 2000 El Paso, Texas It's all true. I can't believe it. I'm a monster. I can't do this anymore. Following the appearance of RPC 360A6, MST X Ray 6 Annullifiers was able to locate the .NET account affiliated with the author of the epitaph. This allowed authority assets to track down the POI's physical address through the use of a related IP address. On January 29, 2000, and a raid was successfully conducted at the apartment complex in San Antonio, Texas. But upon entry, it was discovered that the unit had been abandoned for some time. The website account affiliated with the POI has since then become inactive, and no new leads have emerged. Following this incident, MST X-Ray 6 Annullifiers has been placed in interim standby and is to monitor all activity on .NET until 2000. Registered Phenomena Code 931 Object Class Gamma Purple Hazard Types Pending Further Classification Containment Protocols While containment of RPC-931 is currently observed through paranatural means via Kerr Ashland's anomalous border, growth fluctuations in recent years have led to mounting fears that its autonomous containment there may no longer be viable. See Sighting 931-04 Christened Pages End by Authority Operatives, this boundary remains the most unpredictable aspect of the Kerr Ashland Anomaly, growing more erratic and unstable in effect in recent years. Most manifested denizens of Kerr Ashland assume its more modern corrosive effects are just another aspect of the corruption within the novels. Though as of late, new strains of devotional rhetoric, possibly mimetic in origin, have begun to arise, which pose explicit problems for local Camp Karnak operatives. While direct armed conflict with RPC-931 is proven futile, alternative ritualistic means aimed to prevent the entity from targeting Authority assets have been developed by Prometheus Primogenitus personnel. RPC-931 displays heightened aggression to all peoples and objects non-indigenous to Kerr Ashland. From the Society of Blessed Brian and the Sons of Dagda, groups registered in the Department for Occult Concerns under the Bureau of Acquisition liaise for Thaumaturgical Research into Kerr Ashland. These beliefs are based upon localized folkloristic dogmas sourced from various communities partnered with the Authority Mediators in Kerr Ashland. See below. Temporary Party Authority personnel deployed to Kerr Ashland are to be issued Yannis Wards upon their arrival. Giannis Wards see figure one, are protective talismans crafted from woven punica gratitum leaves. More advanced versions of Giannis Wards, complete with inscribed protection prayers from the Gottis Ott and other relevant sources, are to be disseminated among permanent party personnel. Whenever possible, personnel must attempt to make pilgrimage to the sickly marshes and lustrate themselves within the drowning well. The Drowning Well is a site of ritualistic suicide for those devout to RPC-931. While suicide is animated by nearly all religious sects, the Drowning Well allows those who commit the act to quote, remain close to its waters of holy rebirth, unquote. 
Suicides are usually performed in groups of approximately 21 or more. Synchronous reports have confirmed that those christened in its waters no longer arouse RPC-931's agitated state. As of July 27, 2028, no colloquially sourced incantation, ward, or ritual has proven successful in wholly deterring RPC-931 from its unidentified goal. Other means of containment more geared towards restraint permanence are currently being devised by Dr. Locke and the Chief Care Ashland staff. All Authority personnel should be prepared for a possible emergence incident in the event that RPC-931 attempts to breach containment. Incident Log 166-67 Date November 2, 2028 Staff Participants Captain Fields Containment ANV Wintersheimer Dr. Rissa Containment Resident Medical Liaison Dr. Taggart Research Department of Occult Concerns Mission Task Locate further remnants of RPC-931's emergence and ascertain additional clues to the anomaly's whereabouts. Forward. An atypical male was rescued approximately ten knots off the southern shore of Pabe Island. The unidentified subject, henceforth referred to as John Doe, was recovered displaying signs of acute hypothermia and respiratory trauma due to water inhalation. The subject is known to be unusually large, more than 2 meters in height, with no other notable identifiers or defects. The subject is scheduled for interrogation, following their transfer to Site-007 two days post-retrieval, en route to Pabe proper. Due to the recent emergence incident on Care Ashland, all Authority personnel within the vicinity of the island have been placed in heightened awareness as per protocol. Dealing with Mr. Doe through either amnestization or permanent containment is of the utmost importance. Suceration settles as Dr. Taggart takes the seat across from Mr. Doe, placing his pages down carefully. Quite a surprise seeing you up and awake. Your heart was barely beating when we found you. You were all blue. Mr. Doe does not respond. I believe the exact words Rissa told me about your recovery was that it was nothing short of a miracle. Mr. Doe continues not to reply. Perhaps we can start off with your name? Silence. You'll have to talk to me at some point. You know, it's not every day we find a giant such as yourself near drowned while trawling. Yes, trawling. Is there anyone we can try and contact? A ship you were on, maybe? You know the waters we found you in are restrict- Mr. Doe mutters something inaudible under his breath. What was that? My son, my- Sir? My son. I have to- Need to find him. He's Earth, I think. Your son? Listen! Ugh! Me whole body hurts. You said you found me. Where? At sea. Leagues from the mainland. Can't say exactly but too far out for a leisurely swim. What's the last thing you remember? Ugin… Uh, I would never… What about now? Where are we? We're more or less in Scotland waiting for your medical reports to come in. Scotland? The Isles? I'm home. Ah, now we're getting somewhere. So you're from here. Scotland, I mean. I need to find him. Maybe he's close too. He was hurt. I know I saw it with my own eyes. I've already lost one son. I can't lose another. I. Calm down, sir. We can help, but we can't do much unless you work with us. Make this go quicker. Aye, right. You're right. Mr. Doe remains silent. Are you a man of faith, Mr. Doe? <laughs> Strange question for an interrogation. Not an interrogation. Just some questions. Aim to help jog that jumbled memory of yours a bit. If you're a local, I can only assume the faith may have touched you at one point or another. <laughs> Aye. Been one me whole life. Uh, I think, anyway. You think? It's odd. All a bit floaty. But you remember your boy. He must be important, then. I can promise that we'll find… Don't think you are, though. What? A man of faith you aren't. Baptized under the Church of England as a 
baptized under the Church of England as a boy. Harder to hold on to these days, especially with my love of the literary critics and applying them to scripture. But it's enough. We've more in common than you think, sir. Besides, doesn't change the fact I can see you're troubled and more than a little lost. A found belief helps in times like these. But your eyes, you don't believe in it, not really. Does that bother you? They say a clear eye is a sign of a holy soul. What the soul you must see in me? <coughs> Faith. A pretty word. Bah! I've had me feel of it, enough to last lifetimes. I set my whole world upon it even, but I'm supposing that wasn't enough if what you say is true. Pardon? What I said? Silence. What did I say, sir? <sighs> Liam. You asked for me name. It's Liam. Description. RPC-931 is a beatific draconian entity of unknown size and ability. It is referenced within Gowron's writings as a purely deific being, and as such it is known by multiple names and titles among the endemic peoples of Kerr Ashland, including, but not limited to, Celasta, the Rhapsodist of Reverence, the King That Was, the Empty Crown, Creator, Cleric of the Cosmos, the Horned Prophet, and most predominantly Ah Lim the Gleaming. RPC-931 never officially appears in Gowron's novels, although echoes of his actions are pervasive in most narrative threads in the stories themselves, despite he himself being physically absent for their entirety. All mentions of RPC-931 within the book series are attributed as male. It is currently believed that RPC-931 came into being at irregular intervals following a hypothesized inception point, believed to have occurred sometime after a four-year period, succeeding Kerr Ashland's initial manifestation in the summer of 2020. The exact nature of its dilatorious entry in the later half of 2025 remains a matter of debate among researchers, although the most common belief based on a re-examination of formerly disregarded reports of aberrative circumstances and partial sightings is that RPC-931's arrival was hindered due to its possible imperfect transference within the point of extreme incoherency during initial manifestation. Partial sighting is used in a literal sense here, such as reports of animated draconian skeletal remains in flight, or unusual large mounds of off-tone teratomatous flesh manifesting and demanifesting at random. Depictions of RPC-931 vary from culture to culture, but comparative analysis by field researchers and historians stationed at Camp Karnak have identified several key characteristics concordant throughout all relevant sources. RPC-931 is consistently depicted as the largest dragon to have ever existed, or will ever exist with wings boundless as the night sky. Earlier epic songs and other long-form poetry retrieved from various strains of Elphus tradition, such as the Lay of Presbyter Giannis, make frequent mention of its thick blue iron scales, which weighed a talent each, and its spiraled horns akin to that of a ram. One of the more frequently appearing sagas within the known elven world in Kerr Ashland, it is perhaps the most quoted external piece of fictitious literature within the series. From what little is clear within the Ispasoich, Gowring's unreleased creation story, Presbyter Giannis is a mythical founding poet and hero who arrived in Kerr Ashland in his first cycle, a performer of miracles and an emissary of gods with the gift of a silver tongue. It is strongly suspected by congregants researchers that this character is a reference to the legendary king Prester John from the Nestorian Christian tradition though he also bears a strong resemblance to Finn McCool from Gaelic founding mythology. These later became the standard interpretation, though subsequent other non-canonical and more non-conventional features have been recorded from reports post-manifestation of the Kerr Ashland anomaly, including eyes on the underside of the wings, the mane of a lion, and in the unpublished incomplete Epics of Perusia as a man. Due to RPC-931's assigned acidic nature, its anomalous capabilities are immeasurable. It is, for all intents and purposes, within the boundaries of the Kerr Ashland Anomaly, a god. Moreover, even with our limited observation of the entity, we've seen it rearrange chronological events, 
demanifest objects and itself at will, and display complete autonomy over matter manipulation. See Addendum 931.01. Members of the AET assigned with the observation, experimentation, and examination of the property of the Care Ashland's anomalous border have begun to suspect that RPC-931 may pose a significant threat to the stability of the pocket's semi-permeable dimensional barrier. Anomaly Experimentation Team And your surname? McDonald Risa, can you look that name up? See if we have anything on file? Any other relations? I cannot recall. You… can't recall? I don't can… I just… Are you just gonna keep dancing around like this? No dancing, just questions. I promise they're important. Thought you were gonna help me find the boy. Stop that thing squeal with me. We will, we will. There are already people looking. We will find him, sir. I swear it. Bold of you to lie so blatantly, have it about. You should find him. It won't make sense if you don't. Make sense? Bugger it. Doesn't matter. Right. Tagger clears his throat loudly, grabbing a sheet of paper from the nearby drawer. So, a son, you said. You've only mentioned one child. No wife or other kids? My wife. Did I have a wife? I'm sure you… Nay, I had two bairns. Boys. Aye, aye, two. Brian and Meshu. Had? Brian's… he's… he's not around anymore. Family qualms or something more serious? I cannot say. I don't remember. I don't want to. So then, Meshu. He's who you're looking for, yes? Can you describe him for me? He's like me, just we. He's still a lad, red hair, brightest blue eyes you ever seen. Always smiled. He liked to sing and draw a lot, see? Just like me when I was a lad. Would always make stories that escaped him. Could never quite finish him either. I used to tease him for it. <laughs> you speak as though you haven't seen him in years. Aye. It feels like it. I see him still, when I close my eyes, sitting at this old desk above me somewhere, tooling away, hiding his drawings while he's supposed to be nosing the good book. When I go to him, he's old and gray. Eyes like the void. <sighs> Don't suppose I can have some paper to sketch a bit. Me mind's full of places and things that I can't make out. More dreams. Of course, of course. Dr. Taggart removes a small notebook from under the desk, sliding it across the table to Liam, along with a black fountain pen. Is this alright? Aye. It's… it's good. Aye. Alright, let's try this again. Tell me, Mr. MacDonald, and try your hardest this time. What even is the last thing you remember? Liam takes a long breath. After several minutes of silence, he speaks. That was easy, sir. Fire. Addendum 931.01 Informational Excerpt Transcribed below are several abridged choruses and verses from the East Passage. They have been selected for reference here for their relevance to RPC-931. Original text sourced from Gowron's notes and in-world religious scriptures displayed on the left. Authority of bridge sections on the right. Sick throughout. Excerpt 01 Creation The Canticle of Tosigasir As sung by Presbyter Giannis Ere the sundering of the six suns, ere the world was confined in immutable firmament, Ere even the first elves were born in their starry jeweled nets beyond the veil of night, there was only nothing. This nothing was quiet, formless, empty. This nothing was the place of the low, deep waters, those dusty, stagnant realms where things lay formless, and dreams were trapped in the hanging dark. But nothing cannot last, it gorged upon itself. The foam of the endless sea took shape as a toothy maw swallowed whole at once, became the dragon, for he had consumed all that is, was, and will be, and felt that it was good. 
burst through the gates of his teeth and the fire of his gullet is sung. The first notes, inchoate, were as the undigested water separating land. Their gentle lapping added to the pursuance. Raucously it rang, the hymn of creation. The verse took deeper shape as the second sagacious notes became the sky. The chorus was as the rising and setting of the sun, and it was good. The totality of heaven burned beyond his eyes, as his crownless kingdom formed, he who gave himself sight had harmonized all its contents. The fire of his stomach set first, the sun who was fleeting. The wild waters ameliorated in his image, given purpose and direction. The earth and air, so lofty forgotten, all came to be under his averted poised ardor, and he felt that it was good. According to authority scholars, fire and water's equivoked meanings throughout the Ispisoich allowed both the elves and humans to claim racial superiority as Alem's firstborn. Water, according to human historians, represents the early elves before they extinguished the primordial flame and were broken against their ancestors as the river. Dwarves and lesser dragons portray earth and air respectively. Although racial and class warfare were common themes throughout most of Gowring's works, these specific chauvinistic beliefs are suspected to have developed independently. Excerpt 02 Description Gottest Ott, as sung as Presbyterianus. Early morning found me in my fishing boat, out on the bright waters of the Crimson River. The dawn had come slowly that day, its tiding heralded by a roar of innumerable shofars and a brassy blue light, and I was afraid. Perched upon the sun at the horizon sat the dragon. His horns spiraled out among the stars. They were as that of a ram. Smoke crept from his snout forming the mist that called the far-off lands, as his wings unfurled and it was the blackest of midnight. There was no need for light or lamp in the presence of the Holy of Holies. His sheer colossal form at such propinquity blinded me. Scales were tightly racked against one another, as the shields of a longboat, so dense that his holy glow could not pass through entirely, each one a hundredth weight and in all that awing was sadness. The perdition of his son was palpable, the transgression against him by the other, who in heaven was to keep their son, their brother, their heir smothered as such. The war between them was one without mercy, the inheritance Oidorak adrift amid the dirt. Deep was the mournful melody as it poured from Alim's mouth. Terrible, it cracked the cornerstone of fate. The choir of the world could not muster to meet his booming voice, for he had made ourselves the adversary of God. And thus he departed, a wistful goodbye. I cannot say where he is gone, only that he was. Am I to act as his embouchure and functionary, to be the mouthpiece of the instrument of his will? In the sharpest timber, I cry out to the prophet, the priest, our unburdened king. Grant us the wisdom and serenity to maintain balance until your return. Forgive this wretched form and smite the corruption that besets us. We, your endearing children, recite this outro forever until your return, so be it. Consistently among Gowring's text, the six original great races of Kerr Ashlin men, dwarves, elves, orcs, kobolden, dragons all maintain some semblance of mutual devotion to Yannis' songs. Though lyrical variations and their interpretations vary widely, RPC 931's description here is consistent and remains so even following Kerr Ashland's manifestation. While many adherents to the original faith dedicated to the dragon were purged by the High King of the Spire Elves in the novels as part of the backfired rituals used to tether the Castle of Dreams, strains of the so-called Old Faith have re-emerged following the Kerr Ashland Anomaly's manifestation and baseline reality. Despite having never released any complete canonical descriptions of Alim, the various renditions by all races and people to Kerr Ashland directly match those within Gowan's personal sketches, recovered from prior publisher correspondence preceding his death. See Figure 2. Further elucidation on the exodus of RPC-931 remains a mystery to Authority personnel. The catalyst event of which, referenced within the Gottes Ots verse 15, has gained various titles throughout recorded history. 
most notably known as the smothering of the primordial flame. All peoples within Kerr Ashland when questioned display some form of innate knowledge on the subject, frequently commenting, there was a war, he lost his son. Epics of Parousia, as sung by Presbyter Giannis. The last of the six chains set old and weary, having rusted roots endemic to our world. Their waning chorus, tempo rubato, rattle languidly to a lull. Corruption remains their eternal enemy. All roads sink into the Grand Pit, Nimni. Dead wind lays stagnant on our backs, for it is the breath of the lamented. The sun and stars burn cold and rain ash upon our faces and our fields. We are as an anhydrous adversary, devoid of the waters of creation. Each of the stars fell to earth. The constellation of Proud Hassan and Old Abos collapsed as a husk to the crash of cymbals. The rest thereafter, each one harmonizing the tones of flutes and low-pitched horns, the earth opened up shattering rock and swallowed whole the lands of man to the beat of drums. The Morrigan crows cawed as a murder, signifying there were to be no more battles. It was the crescendo, a cacophony. The signature of time stopped short to the beating of his wings. From beyond the horizon, the misty bed where the sun once slept, the dragon came. A single note of its pearlescent tone silenced the crescenting clangor, and for the last time, he felt that it was good. The world's frail form could no longer stand its might. Its cornerstone ebbed away from old wounds. He who wrote the old magic broke his horns and took the form of his people. From thence he extended with silver branch. From thence he extended the silver branch to the blissful dead, to those living with the old episcopies, into a truer world. A great flood set out from its forms of legion, a flood so great it washed away not just the shadow of the old world, but all worlds. So be it, as is the testament of the songbearers of old. So be it. While every other book within the Ispasoich is considered to be a record of past events, the epics of Perusia wholly reference events that are yet to transpire from the perspective of Giannis. The epics include a rough synopsis of the events within the Kerr Ashland series, and visions given to Giannis sometimes after Alim's departure. However, both sections were unfinished at the time of Gowring's death. These visions specifically detailed the return of RPC-931, which was said to be the last precursor to the destruction of the world, both analogous to the death of Baldir, or the return of Christ. Gowring himself commented on this ending while attending a book signing for the Caves of Crystal in 2017 as, all storybooks end when their father returns. Members of the Prometheus Promogenitus have adduced, based on growth fluctuations throughout Pabe Island, that RPC-931's deific capacity may extend outside of its pocket dimension. We can only assume that each section within the novels, published or not, applies to its anomalous capabilities. Based on the findings above and the passages referenced here, RPC-931 is believed to pose a serious threat beyond what was previously thought possible by Kerr Ashland-based anomalies. The threat level has been raised to purple to reflect these findings. Fire? In the middle of the sea? Nah, it was just some dusty jolly far from home. We were good at gash then. Set the axe stag for some black water or, uh, or petrol. You're a jolly, eh? That explains the physique I gather. So you're on leave from Afghanistan or Iraq and then what? What? Nay. Oman was the last place I remember. Sometimes I felt like that sandbox was more of a home than the Isles. Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, year after year after year. I saw fire rain from the sky in Benghazi. Beast it in Yag to Alexandria over and over again. Nay, it's just bones. I shan't be prone to dits now. Oman? Alexandria? Why would you be there? There hasn't- Dr. Taggart is interrupted by a knock at the door. Pardon me for a moment. Addendum 931.02 Discovery Reports of RPC-931's possible emergence first came to the authorities' attention on October 13, 2025, 
following an investigation of the semen destruction relocation of Briannath Lear, a Spire Elf observatory, whose residents, mostly Spire Elves and their servantry, had been in a tenuous two-year treaty at that point with the Authority for research and reconnaissance purposes. Known to denizens of Kerr Ashland as the Black Company, a moniker associated with a shadowy Known to denizens of Kerr Ashland as the Black Company, a moniker associated with a shadowy group of foreign beast hunters and cell swords in the novels that had previously been expelled from Kerr Ashland before the book's first beginning, which had initially been unplanned but following the dissemination of rumors among locals after a scuffle on the beach of beginnings had been adopted wholeheartedly by Authority personnel. Intercepted calls for help sent by maintenance union personnel stationed at the observatory aiding in its repairs following the manifestation are brief at best and frantically written at worst, as transcribed below. Delivered by bloodlarks, as is customary in Kerr Ashland among Spire Elf communities. The reports reviewed as mere superstitions a year ago were not wrong. They were not wrong. Rocks rain from the sky. Something has raised the seas. Ships turned to trees. The roof became a monster. The roof took Priscilla's head. Help! A serpent haunts the clouds. Harold believes God has woken up and is passing over the waters. Superstition, I thought it was at first. A former human servant for the Spire Elves in the southwest of the Bay of Wethir in the novels. He has since taken a leading position following Kerr Ashland's manifestation, and maintained himself a key role in brokering a deal between the Spire Elves of Briannath Lear and the Authority. I cannot say he is wrong. I cannot say he isn't wrong. Send any able-bodied MST from Camp Cronach as soon as you can muster. We need help. We need help. None of them were wrong. He says we're not right. He says he wants to fix us. Everything's blue. Why is it all blue? Subsequent investigation of Bria Nath Lear revealed the entire observatory to have disappeared from its former location overnight, with no evidence of it having been there in the first place. Scouting nearby using ex situ chartered Exton Hornsby personnel revealed it to have been moved seven miles down the coast. Observable distortions, believed to be from ACS fluctuations, temporarily manifested in the spaces between the juxtaposed positions and across the entirety of the nearby coastline, and to the nearby ruined city of Ellenhall. Anderson Coherency Scale Ellen Hall was one of the three ancestral human cities within Kerr Ashland. It was destroyed by the Elven High King, using enslaved dragons early on in Gowron's novels. Ellen Hall was specifically the religious capital for those devout to RPC-931, and the Yannis wards developed there incidentally became the religious icon for the Old Faith. Roughly two-thirds of the body of the ruins remained suspended upside down in the air, housed within a fluctuating tempest furthermore remaining stationary by unknown means. Most of the observatory's former inhabitants were found with no memory of the events reported in the plea, even going so far as failing to remember the Authority's existence in its entirety. The building itself appears to be completely restored to the same state it was described as having existed within Gowron's novels prior to Kara Ashland's manifestation event. All evidence of Authority extensions have been scrubbed by an unknown actor. None of the maintenance union personnel stationed at Bria Nath Lear were ever recovered among those convened within the building's new location. They have since been presumed dead. What did you find out? You're not going to believe this. He's one of ours. What the vision? Why didn't anyone report him missing? No, you don't understand. He's R-A-V-A-A-F. Unaware. Supplemental Support, Royal Marines. Look at the file. Major Liam MacDonald served during Operation Battle Axe. Brevity, even during the Levant Crisis. Went MIA in the 60s. Must be a mistake. He's barely a day over 50 at most. He's bigger than his records say, and he's younger in his photo too. But it's him. No wife on record, but two sons just like he said, Brian and Meishu. Hmm. And what happened to them? Let me see, uh, Brian is the younger one, he… oh, it's like he said. 
Spit it out, Rissa. Drowned when he was two. So young. What are the other? The one he's looking for. Meishu? He went into the foster system, then up and vanished right when he turned 18. Dr. Taggart pauses. Sam? That doesn't make this mystery any simpler. Right. Back on it, then. Find out what you can on Meishu, and get those medical tests done. I'll get back to working on our subject. On it. RPC-931 Second Sighting didn't occur until March 20, 2026, five months after the October incidents. Camp Cronach Long Range Scouts, formerly tasked with patrolling the outer southwest perimeter of the Corrupted Woods, had failed to return to their forward operating bases within the allotted mission parameters. A heavy cavalry Chevalier unit was thereby dispatched to the scout's last known position in the hopes of ascertaining the exact nature of their disappearance. Immediately upon reaching the eastern border of the corrupted lands, the knights were bypassed by a considerable force of magical beasts fleeing the area. Immense pillars of golden and black smoke were seen rising from the general direction of the Castle of Dreams. They were observed first by personnel at Watcher's Rest, and within seconds, the smoke was visible throughout the entirety of Authority Influence Zones. As suddenly as the smoke appeared, it seemingly demanifested. As it went, a small earthquake shook Camp Cronach, and a single member of the cavalry team manifested in his barracks. His debrief is transcribed below. We had barely ridden past the old motor and spire, as they call it, when we saw what looked like some dark cloud moving towards us at an impressive speed. But it wasn't just a cloud, though. Not at all. In it, there were rather things of all sorts. Birds, fairies, minor winged creatures. Things I'd of course all seen before on prior rangings, but it was different this time. Normally they avoid humans. We barely had time to process the strangest of it all before the rest of the beasts from the woods nearly trampled us. They were all hot-footed as they shot past, all malignant in the sort. Then, we saw why. A deafening roar echoed consistently for nearly twenty minutes across the grounds. A path had been cleared through the brush, the whole of it burning unnaturally fast. When the blackness of the smoke had receded for a moment, there was nothing left but a field of fire. As far as we could see, the valley was ablaze. It came upon us so quickly that Bacchus and Turkbolt couldn't rein their horses in time, barely getting two shouts out before their lives were snuffed. The flame took them like a flash flood. The flames moved like water. They couldn't even scream when they died. Got all of them but me. I don't remember much from what happened in the thick of the firefight. That was nothing but fire and fear and death. But I do know what happened when the smoke overhead parted one final time, when I looked up at last from my cowering under the burning bush after the roaring stopped. Above me, over the castle to my right, loomed a large blue dragon, bigger than anything I've encountered here, even those wyverns and ash folk ride, goddamn bigger than the bones strewn about the desert, that's for sure. God not even hanging, leaning against it. The ruins looked like a toy compared to it. Before I had even realized it, everything was ash, even my horse. My eyes were fixed on the monster before me. It roared so strongly I felt the pressure in my eyes. The woods reformed almost instantly, and I felt myself pulled back there. I blinked and here I was. The hopeful part of me thinks it's the fact I was last in our ranks that I lived. A trick of fate. The other part knows the truth. I don't know how I know, or why. But I just do. That thing in the black sky somehow knew I was there. It had probably known the whole time. And yet, it passed me by. Following these incidents, which confirmed the existence and allotted the classification of RPC-931, further occurrence have been condensed for the sake of brevity. All Authority efforts at this point are to be towards either ascertaining what RPC-931's intentions are and engaging its weaknesses. It is well worth noting that smaller incidents and minor sightings are far more numerous than this subsequent listing, but due to their extreme concision and lack of suitable confirmation by multiple observers, they have not been listed here. Sighting 
RPC-931-03 Location Shadefell Grove Date April 9, 2026 Casualties Death 40 Unknown Reports A hurried message was received from one of the Conroy emissaries tasked with the diplomatic relations with mixed-race orc and human insurgency groups colonizing the vast incoherency pockets by the Shadefell Grove to the north of Briss. A small task force of five to ten elite operatives, or knights, trained to fight as a unit. This terminology and combat tactic was derived from unit organizations in the Middle Ages of the same name. Formed a year or two after the Authority's usurpation of the Dominarchy in the Plains, these groups remained a thorn in succeeding Authority mediation attempts for years preceding the RPC-931-03 event. Suspected to be a partial result of the collapsed siren codes following the inception of the Kerr Ashland anomaly, they warned of strange happenings in both the native landscape and the movements of the aforementioned insurgency groups nearby in the preceding weeks. Additional reinforcements arrived after a three-day journey impeded by rough weather only to find the incoherent zones effectively leveled, with no sign of the previous colonies or any of the protectorate conroys that had been stationed in the area. Sightings of RPC-931 flying in the air up to four days post-incident are corroborated by the remaining two teams, who had evacuated the Briss just before the onset of what they called the Blip, saying the grove had glowed so brightly it was like the sun was rising in the north. Additional observations. Nothing new has changed since the first two sightings. RPC-931's motives remain unknown, though its threat level to authority, Care Ashland operations continue to climb. The two surviving teams claimed that RPC-931 had reacted negatively to attempted direct armed confrontation, which corroborates with its reported demeanor in the RPC-931-02 report. While no bodies have been found in the area, Unlike in the RPC-931-01 report, none of the native cats were recovered. Sighting RPC-931-04 Location Mistwood, five leagues east of Thiesport Date February 19, 2027 Casualties, deaths, null Report Authority personnel stationed at the newly established Briannath Lear Observatory witnessed RPC-931 displaying unusual behavior high above the Mistwood Forest area and the adjacent corrupted zones. Most conspicuously, he was seen stopping at distinctly discordant nebulous spaces within the night sky and seemingly relocating them to their correct spots. How he was able to achieve this, which was obfuscated by the altitude it was observed at, appeared to be by wrapping its horn through the sections of incongruous sky and ripping them from their previous positions, all the while leaving various aurorae in their wake. Additionally, once these sections of the sky were correlated correctly, RPC-931 placed new portions of celestial space in their previous designates. These new sections appeared to have been manifested purely by RPC-931. Additional observations Kerr Ashland's night sky remains one of the most incoherent corrupted spaces, moreover the island's entirety. Written sections of Gowring's drawings of constellations populate its visage. These intermix with baseline reality celestial picture, both of which change each evening as Kerr Ashland's stellar rotation is circumpolar in nature as opposed to Pabe Island's more southern orientation. Dr. Locke commented on the sky's orientation during the initial discovery of the Kerr Ashland anomaly as being, quote, like a puzzle with its pieces strewn about, and every night they're mixed again by some unseen force. Unquote. Due to this, it is unclear what RPC 931's goal was during the sighting, as by the following evening, the sky returned to its incessantly incoherent state. However, the aurora generated during this incident were observed passing through Kerr Ashland's border, the first time any abnormality of this nature was detected doing so. The aurorae were noted to be red in hue, informed by electromagnetic interference of Kp equal approximately 6, intermixed with trace amounts of ionizing Grovian variants, approximately 3 Vi. 
while not believed to be visible from the northwestern Scottish coastline. A cover story involving a minor solar flare was disseminated to the media the following day. Sighting RPC-931-05 Location The Nightmare Road, on the northwest side of the Corrupted Lands Date April 29, 2027 Casualties Deaths 157 523 Report Over an eight-day period, several notable members of the Orcish Dominarchy, Under Guild of the Dwarves, and Ashen Folk military commands with their varied cores vanished in a manner similar to blips observed within sighting RPC-931-04. On the evening of the 29th, RPC-931 was observed flying above the Nightmare Road, re-manifesting the various combatants. All three armies converged and, despite all authority garnered truces, immediately engaged in an all-out war against one another, resulting in a decisive Ashen Folk victory. Additional observations. All belligerents were noted to be those that participated in the Battle of Brittle Boynes in Volume 3, The Sword of Prophecy. Upon further examination, it was revealed that while the main care Ashland plot had carried on past this point canonically, in line with the books, the battle itself had not taken place. The Battle of Brittle Boynes was a major plot point for the series, as it set the Ashen Folk as the predominant faction. Furthermore, it set in motion Meghead Blood Risen's redemption arc after he was captured and later rescued by Hassan. As none of these events transpired, the areas they were purported to have happened were notably more incoherent and corrupted than the surrounding spaces. It was also noted that as each soldier fell, their children, specifically those born sometime chronologically after Volume 3, ostensibly ceased to exist. Further study into chronologically altered events has been deemed non-feasible, as all parties involved are unable to recall said previous knowledge or actions after the altercation. It is not currently known if these occurrences can affect Authority personnel. Sighting RPC-931-06 Location The Deep Refuge Date July 29, 2027 Casualties Deaths Zero, negative one. Report: An Authority research expedition team, studying the Lord of Ashes' thaumaturgical geothermic properties, witnessed RPC-931 flying towards the glass ruby gate of the Deep Refuge. Once there, the entity was met with a heavily armed Ashen Folk defense force. As it shrugged off the blows of wrought iron anti-siege weapons and the most powerful spells available to the Elven Archmages. It breached the gate and welled up, seemingly preparing to unleash its famous fiery breath. However, RPC-931 instead whistled a single plaintive and sonorous tone for several seconds into the cavern's opening, then flew away without further incident. Additional observations Post-incident observation remained inconclusive for some time, as no greater purpose to RPC-931's actions could be easily discerned. The only notable reaction produced by the entity, his brief airy melody, appeared to have had a minor mimetic effect on the indigenous Care Ashland occupants within an unidentified proximity of the event. As he sang, the song transformed for each individual into a variant of their Amren Bris. Literal Translation Verse Song Amren Bris are prophetic psalms performed in a manner similar to Aldim's actions, referenced to verse 3 of the Canticle of the Sigisir. Each person's Amren Breed details their life achievements and is unique to only them. Update. Four days after the event, a disturbance was reported inside the tomb of Hassan Maza. The tombstone door, erected by the late Sivilis Vivath, appeared to have been opened from the inside by its now risen sole occupant. Hassan's miraculous recovery from death has since been kept a secret by both the Ashen Folk aristocracy who feared this miracle would set in motion another uprising, and the authority to the same extent. Hassan has refused to communicate with any representatives from either party, and has only expressed heavy chagrin since its revival. His only statement post-reincarnation, allegedly made as he was seen departing his former grave, is as follows. I was brought back not once but twice, and this time you were dead. 
not even there for me. Should not even my failings be my own? Hassan has since escaped his internment, turned holding cell, following a lapse of security by Ashen Folk personnel. When reprimanded, each member of the Ashen Folk Guard stated that Hassan was a divine being, now beyond their right to hold. All Authority Conroids have been ordered to attempt to detain Hassan in the event they locate him. I'm sorry about that, I was just… Did you find me, boy? No, not directly at least. We're looking into it. Even making headway. <laughs> How old are you, Liam? What? You're being a real naff now. Blethering on. Can you just answer the question? Eh, I cannot remember. You can't remember? I feel old, though. Old enough to make the dirt feel like a lad again. I feel like a regular Methuselah. Well, you don't look that old, but according to what we have, you should be dead, Liam. Dead? Yes. Who said that? I don't… It's not important, sir. Hmm. Suppose it's like the good book says, Eve to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you, and I will carry you. I will sustain you, and I will rescue you. Isaiah? Chapter 48 That's all well and good, sir, but it doesn't really answer my question. Liam says nothing. Shuffling is heard as Dr. Taggart looks at the file Risa brought him. Right. Maybe this will get us there. Were you born in 1921? Aye, I cannot recall exactly, but it sounds spot on. Well, going off on biblical parallels, I'd say you're more Moses than Methuselah. By the numbers, you're nearly 106 years old. Nay. What year do you think it is? Come off it! It's only been a decade or two since the big one. The big one? You mean the Second World War? Aye. That was over 80 years ago, Liam. Let's go back to the last thing you remember, alright? The fire, you said. I was guarding a lorry. It was full of petrol. We were all chin-strapped. Then those gummy rebels started lobbing shots at us. A big one hit the truck, then fire, then water. When we found you? Nay, I was… It was like a memory. Or a dream, I thought. Looking up at Meishu at his disc. It was all drink and bury you. Nay, I was… It was like a memory. Or a dream, I thought. Looking up at Meishu at his disc. It was all dreek and weary about, like some loathsome nothing. I heard him rambling up there, like he was a lad reciting the scriptures. It was my boy. I ken it was him. A father knows his boy always, but his voice was old and strong like mine. He was saying something like, Woven together in the depths, your eyes saw me unborn body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. I don't understand. Liam, I… Dr. Risa knocks at the door. Observation Conclusion All appearances of RPC-931 were thus observed to involve two consistently recurring trends. Disappearance, death, or reincarnation of individuals within the Kerr Ashland story matrix. Some kind of modification or alteration of various events and locations though the permanence of said modification varies from sighting to sighting. Additionally, it is now evident that every alteration made by RPC-931 appears to be correlated directly with some degree of explicit deviation to the novels. These are believed to be caused by authority modification, defunct transfer between Gowring's works and the Care Ashland Anomaly manifestation, or the hypothesized influence of other external actors yet unknown to us. While initially assumed to be entirely random, analysis of newer sightings of RPC-931 juxtaposed against the aforementioned myths and supposed earlier sightings locations brought to light information that effectuated several new hypotheses. Data recorded from installed AECR centers integrated into the non-anomalous outer section of the Care Ashland barrier were introduced to measure approximate coherencies in Care Ashland proper, with conflicting findings but not too divergent to lend a dearth of conclusion. A new trend has been revealed, beyond initial observation, 
though it still uses incomplete data to make its assertions. RPC-931 is drawn exclusively to locations with either high or low coherency, approximately ranging from differences of 2.5 or greater on the coherency scale. While most of Kara Ashland fulfills such a descriptor, RPC-931 explicitly avoids areas that match its baseline frequency of approximately 3.65. Sites impacted by RPC-931 all initially had coherency readings that far surpassed normal quanta, only to display anti-entropic qualities in the months following at a level roughly equivalent to levels within Claire Ashland's baseline. Put simply, things intrinsically become normal. RPC-931's movements are therefore, theoretically, not unpredictable at all. They can be tracked and possibly also even something we had previously thought impossible, containable, inside an area of perpetually fluctuating coherency. As such, Page's End has been proposed as the perfect containment site for RPC-931 as its entropic qualities has as of yet remained immeasurable. The most daunting course of action now is leading RPC-931 there via the use of several theorized destabilization methods based on the recommendations of philologists and thaumaturgical experts, approved for application. Containment protocols have been hereby updated to reflect this. To Liam. I'll give you a moment to process. The Dr. Risa. What have you got? Tests came back. All of them aired out. What? I was confused too, so I went down to that lab and looked for myself. Blood. DNA. All his biometrics read null. What do you mean? He's not organic, Sam. But we drew blood. I can hear him breathing while we've been talking. What? All his samples were the same. A complex medium of various acids and iron sulfate. That's not my department, Risa. In English, please. He's ink. No. You don't think? I do. He's from the Anomaly. He has to be. No, no. I mean, do you suppose he's our big bad? The dragon? I'm afraid you're speaking outside my department now. Care to elaborate? He who wrote the old magic broke his horns and took the forms of his people. From thence he extended a silver branch to the blissful dead. It's not far off from the Apostles' Creed. Jesus. What? I don't… The father and his prodigal son. Or maybe the other way around this time. It's Locke's transference theory. Dr. Taggart takes a deep breath and collects himself momentarily. Let me guess. You couldn't find Mayshu in the system because he changed his name. How did you know that? My people have only just put that together, and we haven't even figured out what he changed it to. Don't bother. I already know bits of this old sob story from the interviews. I was a fan, you see of Meishu's, or if I'm right, of Gowering's. Wait, Gowering? I don't mince words, Risa. You mean, yes, I think that one of Liam's boys is none other than the man himself, Gowering. Containment Attempt RPC-931 Department Containment Authorization 3CA Subject RPC-931 Date October 21, 2028 Staff Dr. Locke Dr. Asharu Knight Captain Vaughn Forward A task force comprised of Knight Captain Vaughn's Conroy, armed with automatic Mark V crossbows with runic explosive bolts, supplemented with an Ashen Folk Battle Mage Brigade, have been tasked with protecting a mobile destabilization unit en route towards Page's End. Each knight has been baptized and displays a Yannis ward, embossed on their breastplate, in line with current containment protocols. Once RPC-931 has taken the bait, the task force must attempt to lead the entity towards their destination. It is currently believed that Page's incoherency fluctuations will relatively quickly trigger the dragon's instinctual desire to fix its surroundings and shift its focus off of the task force. Due to the aforementioned indelible fluctuations, the time in which the group must attempt to distract RPC-931 is unknown. This operation is dependent on a variable of luck, 
However, as RPC-931's effects continue to escalate in unforeseen ways, we are faced with no other option. Operation Status Failure RPC-931 is believed to have broken containment. Reports remain inconclusive post-op, but according to AECR automatic alarm systems along the northern section of Pabe Island, RPC-931 appears to have broken through the barrier and entered baseline reality. These findings are also supported by a series of sudden salvos of Grovian radiation from the excursion point. 35.1 VI. Additionally, one of RPC-931's horns was located in the North Sea three days post-incident. Object Class Escalation to Omega is currently pending approval. As modern recording technology is not available to us within Care Ashland, the explicit details of the operation's failings are unknown. However, due to the abundance of eyewitnesses from the subsequent recovery of every Authority member taken by RPC-931, the general order of events is quite clear. Knight Captain Bond's testimony of the event remains the most revealing and concise. His debrief is transcribed below. Debrief Interview 93101-01 Interviewed Knight Captain Bond, Kilo-05 Officer Interviewer Dr. Locke Chief Care Ashland Researcher Begin Log 1435 October 21, 2028 You know the rigmarole. What happened out there? Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. That was a mess. We knew this was a crapshoot from the start, but it really went ass up. Doing from the start, hmm? Hardly. We couldn't have asked for a smoother op. Everything went according to plan. We set up on the ridge above while I had the pointy ears guard the destabilizer. They handled the ships better. What was that thing, anyway? The device? Yeah. Classified. Pfft. <laughs> Regular rigmarole. Anyways, we got it running and sure enough, the dragon took the bait. We stepped up as close as we could to the edge, but it was so ass-backwards out there you couldn't really judge distance. Did you notice anything unusual about its behavior? You're kidding, right? It's a dragon. I mean, the wards and everything seem to work, if that's what you're on about. He barely noticed us. Between our fire support and the spells from the pointy ears, it was quite the show. I say fire support like we were doing anything, but it was more like jangling keys in front of a baby as we carried on. God, the size of it, though. Gave me vertigo just being near it as it followed us all the way to the edge. I don't understand. You suffered no casualties, and it sounds like it all went perfectly. You even managed to locate and rescue the missing personnel taken by the Entity. Where were they? Were they in Page's End? Hold on, I'm getting to that. I knew this debrief was coming, and I still don't know how to describe… well, I don't even know what. You see… It was all fine and good until he switched focus and went for… it. As I said, it was perfect, but there was something else there. Something else? You've seen it, right? Pages end, I mean. It's wild. Land becoming sky with rips in the foreground like it's made of paper. Black, inky rain shooting every direction. And those are the bits we can even make sense of. There was something else inside it, too. It almost looked like another dragon. Malformed and scaleless. It was fleshy looking, but the sound it made was something like screeching metal. The ashes froze at the sight of it. They called it the Eidolon Worm. Wait, you saw the Eidolon Worm? Not for long. Our boy didn't take too kindly to it. I think it's what pissed him off. The second this worm popped up, well, that's when he stopped caring about us. That would match our intel on both entities. Well, 931 ripped its head off. Pardon? It beelined right for it. Jesus. The sounds those two made when they hit. They easily outclassed the explosion from our bolts just by smashing into each other. Then, in what felt like an instant, there was nothing. Their bodies started almost phasing in and out, blinking. One moment you see the two beasts going at it. The next. They're gone. Or static like a painting, or like ink bleeding off a piece of paper. Static. Yeah, that's it. It was like one of the old TVs, when the signal was on the fritz, 
and the picture waved about or inverted at random. Even felt like other channels filtered through as they shot about. It really was like warming up the old tubes in the TV. It's like the whole place was coming alive. The worm was outside his weight class, though. 931 pinned it down and before I realized what was happening, bit its whole head off. We had no idea the worm was there, just on the edge. If we knew… Doesn't matter, because the second 931 took that bite something happened. It was like it burned him, or maybe he choked on it. He started thrashing about even worse than that headless monster, coughing up insane amounts of water, and when it hit the ground it immediately evaporated into a heavy, misty fog. Here's the crazy part, though. That's where we found our missing people. In the worm? In the mist. They just wandered out of the thickest parts in tens and twenties, just where you couldn't see clearly. Not just our guys, either. Everyone taken by 931. All the while the worm was spewing its oily black blood from its neck. I say blood, but it was more like ink. It intermixed with what was already there, and started coming down hard now, like the sky or ground for that matter since all aspects of what was normal just lost themselves in that kaleidoscope. Ripped open. It was an absolute hellstorm. Some of it looked like it was forming words as it fell. I recognized some of the letters, but I couldn't read them. Possibly due to low ACS interactions with left-brain functions, it gives off that dreamlike impression of indecipherable text. Remember when we did that op outside of Site-014 recontaining 139? I remember, but this was something else entirely. All of it. It felt biblical. I was frozen in awe. But what made the dragon try to breach containment? Between the chaos of the blood rain, the mists, and the hordes of people fleeing in terror after just being revived, I guess, it's hard to say what happened. It must have been like sharks in the water, or whatever else calls that shithole home, because the whole place seemed to shimmer with excitement. Shim? Yeah, I know, it's an odd turn of phrase, but the air felt electric. The deepest holes in that torn foreground woke up. Eyes wakened to see the commotion, and in them I traced the black lines from the coagulated rain to the worlds within. Starting from the blood of the Eidolon worm, five rivers bled into the tears of those mirrored spaces. At their basins, the little ichor boiled. From the waters and the formless tears, they came. Captain Bond pauses momentarily to catch his breath. It was obvious they must have been creatures from care once. Ones that you usually see close to the edge. Maybe fairies, or those fish people we encountered when scouting the sunken isle three years back. But whatever they'd been, they sure as hell weren't that anymore. I saw smoky hydras with shitloads of eyes instead of scales. Lizards with bird heads covered with slimy feathers. Elves with webbed wings instead of arms and legs. Humans, too, but they had no faces. They didn't feel real. They felt dreamlike compared to the elves next to me. Compared to 931. Compared to what came next. Hmm. Sounds to me like mild symptomatic wanderer syndrome. It's not particularly common for that severity to hit Kara Ashland's staff. Perhaps… No, you… Ugh. You could be right. I remember all of it so vividly, though. A shifting city that felt like a hungry lie. A sea of doubtless corpses so old existence itself grew around them. An ocean of husk and ash with their grand tunnelers that rivaled the dragons before me. A bastard world A bastard world of brazen wings and whispering snakes, supping on bloody ecstasy. A void so black and featureless that I couldn't fathom its um anything really. The younger Bivath commented somberly at it. The eyes of the father rest in his quiet tomb. I still don't know what he meant by that exactly, and honestly, I don't think he does either. Viscount Sybil Bivath, son of Sebleth Bivath, led the Ashen Folk Battle Mage Brigade for this operation. You couldn't make the last one out, but Bivath could? That's possible evidence of a native's ideological transference. What? Never mind, it's just a theory. So what happened next? He up and left. I cannot say why. Whether it was from the Eidolon Worm leaving some final malediction, or some wound sustained from Page's end eternal bullshit. Personally, I think he saw something in those worlds that hurt him in some other way. 
That's what I felt then. Something just deeply painful. He sped off with purpose, and when he hit that barrier, well, the show wasn't over. It was like a goddamn nuke, an explosion with every color of the spectrum shooting out. Interesting. It didn't quite look like that on our end. So what did you do? Honestly, I thought he was dead after all that, so we rounded up everyone we could manage and marched back. End log. 1527. October 21, 2028 Christ, how did he know? Pardon? How did he know something happened? To his son? He knew. You could hear it in his voice. There's so much we don't know about that place, Care Ashland. What Gowering meant. What did he think? Did he intend for this to happen? Was it Gowering's thought to the boy who saw his father as invincible? Or was it that father's desire to be with his son in any way he could? Maybe it was us, when we saw greater meaning or purpose when there was none. My colleague Lancel believes it was simply Gowering, the author, tying literary themes of God the Father to a literal base. Dr. Taggart pauses. And you? I'm a well-read man, Risa, as I'm sure you've guessed. Even for my field, as filled with crackpots and hellions as it is, one of my favorite literary critics once wrote something similar to all this mess, claimed that writing is that neutral, composite, oblique space where our subject slips away, the negative where all identity is lost, starting with the very identity of the body writing. I've always loved that bit, even committed it to memory, but I don't think I ever understood it, not until now. <laughs> it's all so literal. Dr. Taggart is directly quoting La Morte d'Atire by French literary critic Roland Barthes, 1915-1980. Very pretty, Doctor, but enough waxing poetic. What do we do with him? Prep a permanent containment cell. Get Dr. Locke on the phone. He'll love to rack his brain on this. Are you going back in there? No, I can't. How do I tell him both his sons are dead? How do I tell him that he is too? Beyond that, how do I tell him that he is, in all likelihood, nothing more than any of the other characters from his boy's stories? Go print out those reports, Risa. Dr. Locke will want to see them. Risa nods, leaving the room. <sighs> Besides, by the look on his face, I think he already knows. End log. Registered Phenomena Code 931 Object Class Beta White Hazard Types Sapient Possibly Animated Containment Protocols RPC-931 is to be held in a standard furnished humanoid containment cell at Site-007. The subject, which is now believed to be non-anomalous outside of the aspects of its composition and creation, is innocuous and subsequently housed within the Site's low security wing. Items recovered relating to RPC-931 are to be housed within various Alpha-level secure lockers within the site subsections. To date, the Authority has recovered RPC-931's left horn, several hundred scales, and five sizable claw fragments. RPC-931 is cordial and displays extensive knowledge of the Kerr Ashland anomaly. As such, he has been given Class Zero CA affiliate clearance in regards to pertinent matters on the subject in exchange for additional amenities. Per contra, RPC-931 is to be explicitly denied access to information pertaining to religion or thaumaturgic studies. Staff members at Site-007, per their overwhelming request, may visit RPC-931 when approved by either Dr. Locke or Dr. Taggart. Warning. Under no circumstances is RPC-931 to be permitted in or near the Kerr Ashland Anomaly, as the stability of the dimensional barrier has normalized in the months following the emergence incident. Further destabilization of this nature could lead to a cascading coherency collapse. Description. As RPC-931's delineation descriptors are currently being debated by members of the Research Division, it has been designated simply as a lesser extra-dimensional entity. However, as an extra-dimensional anomaly of this specific nature has never been observed prior, skeptics among the staff have voiced concerns about the entity's affable nature. 
RPC-931 resembles a Caucasian male weighing approximately 200 kg and standing at 229 cm. Despite having manifested within the Kerr Ashland anomaly sometime between 2020 and 2025, the entity claims to be one Liam MacDonald. Liam MacDonald, 1921-1965, was a Scottish-born Royal Marine who went MIA, presumed dead, during the Dofar Rebellion. He was survived only by his son Maceu MacDonald, who later changed his name to Randolph Gowring in 1978 after leaving the foster care program and before releasing Spelltaker in the later half of the same year. Due to the poorly understood nature of the Kerr Ashland manifestation event, the precise parameters surrounding the ideological merging of Liam MacDonald and Ah Lim has been theorized to be based on the subconscious transference of Gowron's inspirations and personal feelings towards its father. See Ideological Transference Theory and Subconscious Metrics by Dr. Locke for further information. Although this thesis was initially dismissed, as all Kerr Ashland manifestations have to appear in text at some point throughout Gowring's shared story matrix, Authority personnel later discovered an unreleased book dedication featuring RPC-931 set to be on the jacket cover of Volume 6, Castle of Dreams. Following a re-investigation in 2029 reviewing the materials confiscated from Gowring's publisher after his death, it reads as follows. It may come as a shock to those of you who never put two and two together, that not once have I ever dedicated my work to anyone. I always thought it was such a silly premise, to attribute one's pursuits like some gift outside of the logical confines of their perseverance and dedication to the craft. That is, until I reached this point, the accumulation of thirty-six books, and with this the thirty-seventh. Now the folly of my prideful youth has faded. I dedicate this series to you, my late father, to whom I owe more inspiration than I can rashly fathom at such an emotional peak. You taught me to be a man and fear God. I know you left to protect me. I know you left because of what happened. And I know you loved me, even if you were unable to say it at the end. A toast of Adam's wine in your honor, and may the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. The rains fall soft upon your fields, and until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. To the God-fearing Major Liam MacDonald.